All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the second day of May in the year of our Lord, 2022. Monday. Well, yesterday I had to fill in for a pastor at the church I attend um, because he's not physically able to, uh, doesn't have the strength right now to do that, uh, to preach. So, um, I started the book of Colossians, a short book in the New Testament, figuring I might have the opportunity to actually get through that on and off. I think uh, next Sunday, I haven't heard yet, but next Sunday I think they're going to be somewhere else too. Whether or not I'll be prepared because I'm preaching out of the scriptures. That it, I like preaching through a book in the New Testament because that it's what God says. It's what God teaches. They don't need to know my opinions on things, <laughs> but I usually give it anyway. I think I started out with a, a, a statement, there's no such thing as contemporary Christianity. I might as well share that here, too. I pointed out that, that the, newest, the newest book in the, in the New Testament, in the Bible, the newest book, the latest writing in the Bible, is over 1,900 years old. There is nothing contemporary in this book with the times. Yet, on the other hand, it is eternal. So everything it has to say is relevant to whatever time it is. Because it's God's Word. So is Christianity relevant? Any Christianity that can go out of style is not biblical Christianity. You know, I pointed out, this is the, the church I attend happens to be a Nazarene church. Uh, that's one of the closest churches around here. And why I go there, I think I've explained it before, is even though I, I, I'm not a Nazarene and I couldn't officially join because I have to accept the position of the Nazarene denomination on some things, and they're just not biblical on all things. So I said, no, I'm not gonna, I can't do that. But I can attend there. I can serve there. I can love the brethren there. I go there because... The brethren, the Christians, born-again Christians, gather together there. I'm not gathering as a Nazarene. I'm gathering as a follower of the Nazarene, which is where the Church of the Nazarene comes from. Jesus was called a Nazarene. Just another version of Church of Christ, I guess. But uh, might as well mention it. That, that they have some good slogans, but that's all they are, is slogans. Churches of Christ... Traditional Church of Christ say, no book but the Bible. Yeah, yeah, I've been accused of being, uh, I didn't get the idea from them, by the way. Sola Scriptura, I've been accused of being Scriptura Nuda. Apparently for other people, script, uh, Sola Scriptura means uh, the Bible plus uh, um, Calvin's Institutes of Christian Religion or or, or the, the Book of Concord or... Uh, for Roman Catholics, all tradition, and the Pope and the Magisterium. So that's script, Sola Scriptura. <laughs> now, actually, Catholics aren't Sola Scriptura. Officially, there's tradition plus that and the Magisterium. But, uh, you know, so a lot of Protestants say they're Sola Scriptura, but they're not. Luther wasn't Sola Scriptura. Neither was Calvin. Neither was who else? Well, I'm not sure about Zwingli. He died in battle. Um, no, Zwingli wasn't Sola Scriptura. I'm trying to think of what it... The Anabaptist, the Anabaptist movement started... Uh, historically, it's reckoned to have started with, with Zwingli in Zurich. Am I right on Zurich? 
But uh, Zwingli uh, was a pastor of the church there. He became a, a reformer, and he was having a Bible study, and members of his Bible study uh, said, well, the Scripture says this. I think it was talking about a, a believer's baptism. And Zwingli agreed that the Scripture taught that, but they said, well, why don't we start doing that? And Zwingli said, well, no, we have to get approval from the city council. Constantinian Christianity. The government must approve. And the Bible students said, his students said, no, if God says it, if the Scripture teaches it, that's the end of the discussion. We've determined from the Scriptures that that's what it teaches, without a doubt. And Zwingli agreed. What does the city council have to do with it? They haven't been studying the Scriptures. Good point. So that was... Uh, uh, what's generally regarded as the uh, the beginning of the Anabaptist movement during the Reformation period. And, of course, they were promptly uh, persecuted, and when you caught them, you put them to death. Uh, they were... Uh, they were... The, the movement was born out of this book, out of faith in Christ. And they, of all the, uh, the people... In the Reformation era, they were probably the biggest ones, like like uh, Menno Simons, uh, the Mennonites. Uh, as far as preaching, you must be born again. Now, today, the ancestors, you have the Mennonites, and you have the, the Amish, which is a reform, a, a split off. They're like the holiness movement to the Methodists. Uh the, the Mennonites are getting cold and worldly, and the Amish were trying to restore it back to what uh, Amon re considered the original idea. Now, it wasn't really the original idea, but that's the way it is. It's like the holiness movement is Wesleyan, but it's not really Wesleyan. It is part of Wesleyan. It's the emphasis of a particular doctrine that really wasn't Wesley's doctrine, or the Christian perfectionism. Wesley tolerated it. He sometimes said things like that, but he was, he said, he, I'm not going to oppose it, was Wesley's view. <laughs> if you can say Wesley had a view. Now, if you've read Wesley's sermons and some of Wesley's works, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it rather confused um, unlike Calvin, which was, he was never confused about anything and said so emphatically. <laughs> Calvin had an attitude. Luther had an attitude too, but Calvin really had an attitude. And maybe it was part of the times. Where was I going with that? I have no idea. It's relevant in a odd way, uh, but uh, oh, a Nazarene rabbit trail. But I go there because the saints gather there. That's why. And uh, sometimes I wonder. So I figure if when I preach out of the Bible, I, this is why I do the nursing home too. So it's, it's if I, I'm going through the text and I'm just preaching the text as I go through it. So. I might expand a little bit on it and try to clarify it, whatever, uh, where I think it might be helpful. But there's always a distinction between what I'm reading out of the Scripture and what I say about it. So I might say, I, might, I don't like this particular translation here in this particular version. I think this one's better. I'll do that. But, uh, but I'm giving them God's Word. And the reason I do that as far as uh, maybe correcting the translation, because... The translators aren't inspired by God, and I don't. I, can, I don't care how many degrees they have. I have the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to say, and you know, when there's like two different ver ways of translating, it, one makes sense biblical, and the other biblically, and the other doesn't quite. I'm going to go with the one that makes sense, <laughs> makes the best sense. So, because I want to communicate God's word. What did God say? Now, if I'm wrong, I'm still doing the best I can at it. So. Anyway, I want to point out a problem with Bible translations, too. 
this is a before I really start talking about what I want to start talking about. This is Colossians two eighteen. Just happened to notice this this morning as I was looking at the section I want to look at in here, and I want to show you why you have to be careful about Bible translations. Now, see at the top here, you've got the King James and the New King James. Okay, uh, these are both literal translations. Now, everybody that's done that that studied any other languages knows there's no such thing as a word for word translation. You could try to do word for word. Sometimes you look at it though, well, they maybe should have expanded that or put a footnote at the bottom of the page that expanded it or something, but <clears throat> uh because there's there's not a a corresponding word always between say Greek and English. It just it's different cultures, not like Spanish and English. Yeah, you 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 try you have to understand it and then translate it, and there's you. It's not going to be perfect. You can't. Even uh, English, when we're talking to somebody else, my understanding of what I'm seeing and reading is not the same as your understanding of what I'm seeing and reading. That's why we must be born again. See, if we all have God's Spirit in them, we have the author. Now, not everybody has the author dwelling in them. But real Christians do. And he's also our fellowship, our koinonia. He's what binds the church, the real church together, which is not an uh, a institution, an entity out there. It is God's people. And Christ is what binds us together. That alone, not nationality, not language, not skin color, not uh, well, other than we all had Adam, <laughs> we were all sinners, and have now been saved. But that Christ is what binds us together. So here, the King James and the New King James. The New King James is just an update of the King James, um, almost identical. Now and then they made some slight changes if the King James didn't follow, uh, you know, if they could do it without, uh, because the Greek was was not, uh, you know, I could, might say, and the King, New King James might say heavens, plural, and the King James says heaven. Well, that's because you can't, you, you're translating it to make it understandable, too, and the uh, New King James said, well, we can make it more accurate without causing confusion, so let's do that. There was a reason to do it, but normally they just follow it very closely. So you can see here, let no one beguile you of your reward in a, in a, a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, the King James, intruding into those things which he hath not seen. Now there is a textual variant here. Uh, some Greek texts have the word not seen or not, and some don't. <laughs> now, generally, the probability that the not dropped out is more than it was inserted. So, the vast majority have not seen is the reading. Uh, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Okay. New King James, let no one cheat you of your reward. Um, that the, the beguile and cheat there, by the way, is um, t it's more like ta the idea of taking you captive, making you slaves, capturing you and putting you in bondage is one of the concepts behind this word. Uh, or taking you in bondage to false ideas. See, it, it's it's more than just giving you a false thing. It's it's more than just say when it says cheat here. I don't think that's quite strong enough. But you don't want to go too far. It does carry that meaning of your reward, taking delight uh, in humility. Let me check something here. Uh, uh, yeah, I can mean that. See, uh, see, there, there's 
See, every word has a range of meanings. It's called a synaptic domain. And it's the same in English, but we have a, sm a larger vocabulary in English, which causes problems in translation, too. So which English word do you pick? As in Greek, though, you have a smaller vocabulary and has a, long, a wider range. So God inspired the Greek, and so you can take the whole range and say, okay, what is this? How does this fit? And so our English bigger vocabulary causes some translational issues, too. Sometimes our vocabulary is smaller, like love. Uh, the Greek has at least three words for that. And the English has one. We call almost everything love, including things God calls abominable and destructive and wicked. We call that love. Yeah. It has nothing to do with love. It has to do with selfish desires. Because <laughs> selfishness and love are not supposed to go together. Uh, but... So the King James, uh, uh, you know, it ends here, both of them vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Both of them are identical there. So there's a few words that are changed a bit, but... Uh, though this is a very accurate reading, the New American Standard says is an accurate translation to let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement. And the worship, see, this is humility, uh, self-humiliation, uh, and the worship of angels. So this is like monkery, as Luther called it, uh, uh, monasticism, where they they beat themselves with whips and wear garments they never wash and all kinds of things. Uh, Self-abasement, subjecting themselves to their superior in a groveling manner and Utterly, this is man-made religion. Intruding into those things which he, or excuse me, taking his stand on visions uh, in italics here, which means it's inserted. He has seen. See, here it doesn't has not seen in the others, and here it says he has seen. Inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. Now, the ESV, the ESV is not consistently literal. This is why I do not like it. it. It, Sometimes it's literal, and then sometimes it's not. You don't know. Let no one disqualify you. Huh? That's not what it says. Insisting on asceticism. That's not what it says. And the worship of angels. Uh, by the way, the word angel could be messenger. You know, messengers like Luther and Calvin. People worship. Or John MacArthur. There's people out there that worship John MacArthur. They adore him. They would grovel before him. <sighs> In spite of the fact he keeps being exposed. Do not make heroes of people that aren't worthy of it. Worship Christ. Worship God. That worshiping even sinless angels. No! Uh, so, uh, wor the worship of angels, that's basically, a, but it also means messenger. So, that's the basic meaning, messenger. Whether natural or divine. Going on in detail about visions, that's an exaggeration. Puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. <clears throat> this is a paraphrase. This is not a literal translation. It doesn't say sensuous mind. It says fleshly mind, sarks, carnal, natural mind. What you have before you're born again, your fleshly mind. Sensuous is, is a different under meaning. They're inserting their own idea. See, this is a, a interpretation of the verse rather than trying to translate it without putting your own spin on it. This is, this is why I cannot tolerate the ESV. 
because it does things like this, which makes it unreliable for serious Bible study. NIV. NIV is a paraphrase called a dynamic translation. In other words, it's like a mild paraphrase instead of an outrageous paraphrase, like the Message Bible. NIV. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. That's not what it says. That's not what it says. Disqualify. Disqualify you. What does that mean? Disqualify you from what? Doesn't say anything about disqualify you. This is, this is, you're getting so much into, more and more into interpretation and your personal understanding, the personal understanding of the translator. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. What do you mean, what they have seen? What are you talking about there? Who knows? They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. Well, unspiritual is correct, but it doesn't. it's not the same as fleshly mind. You'd be better to translate it as natural mind. Unspiritual sort of gets the idea. But that is not, the, the word in the Greek does not say unspiritual. That, that just drives me nuts. Now the NLT, so we're going farther down the list here, the worse it gets as far as the quality of the translation. The NLT is far worse than the NIV in general. Do not use that garbage. I've seen an awful lot of the, the uh, progressive Nazarenes. <laughs> I don't know what else you can say about them. Those that are following the world, the 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 contemporary worship Nazarenes, the con uh, man, there's a lot of them going. I, you you wouldn't think you'd find that in a holiness denomination because holiness is about separation unto God, belonging to God. It's not about belonging to the world. It's about being separate from the world. So when Nazarene churches are chasing after the world so with seeker-sensitive churches and contemporary music, as in, like, Christian music that was produced in the last 90 days as part of their worship, you know, you got to pay special license fees for that, too. That's ridiculous, unless they're just breaking copyright laws. Who knows? So that's, that's not... Another issue. Don't let anyone, NLT, New Living Translation. The Living Bible was the original, and it was uh, Dr. Taylor basically produced a paraphrase for his, his young daughter. So like in the Old Testament, it says, says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. It's translated, I believe, in the... Uh, in the Living Bible as a as a flashlight to light my way or something like that. The flashlight. Well, to just just use the King James and explain it to your child. That's what the pastor is supposed to do. The King James, I I I, I use the new uh, the uh, the new King James because uh, I just get tired of. Try repetitively redoing the vocabulary. So, but the King James is uh, excellent translation. It just are it's just dated. The vocabulary is uh, you need to translate the King James now. So, so don't let anyone condemn you. That is wrong. Completely different idea. This is not what the Bible says at all. By insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels. It doesn't say pious self-denial. 
I mean, you could sort of get that idea. But that's not what it says. Or the worship of angels saying they have had visions about these things. No, it doesn't say that either. Their sinful minds have made them proud. It says nothing of the kind. That's like what a preacher might say explaining the verse. You know, the, your interpretation of it and application of it. But that's not what God said. So avoid the NIV the, the, in the order of avoidance, the worst is the NLT. The next would be like the NIV or the Christian Standard Bible. That's the, the Southern Baptist version of the NIV with their own publishing house. <laughs> or and then the ESV, it's bad. It's not reliable. Because they are not telling you what God actually said. It's important what God said. So what I generally, the, uh, my order of preference would be, uh, depend, if you're familiar with the King James, please just use it. You don't have problems with copyright, uh, people updating it, things like that. Uh, it's been around for 400 years, it still works. But you have to explain. What, <laughs> you've got to put it in modern language yourself, basically. So you got the new the King James and New King James and the New American Standard. Those are three reliable ones. New American Standard, I think it's a very good translation, except it's based on the critical text. There's very little difference, though. There's only about two or three places that even matters. So let's go uh, to what I want to talk about, which is, uh, let me figure out what I'm doing here. Go up to uh, chapter two. What am I doing on time? Okay, so this is was the uh, half an hour of rabbit trail, but educational rabbit trails, the best kind of rabbit trails. And it's all relevant. <clears throat> so, what does Colossians say here? Chapter 2, starting at verse 1. For, uh, let me, no, I don't want to start right there. Verse 8. Verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. Philosophy, man's wisdom. According to the tradition of men, <clears throat> according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Basic principles of science. The word science is actually from the was Latin scientia, which means knowledge. What man claims to know, what he doesn't really know at all. <clears throat> it's like evolution. My answer to an evolutionist: prove it, prove it. Yeah. You know, do I have that around here? Where is that? I had it laying here the other day. Might be in the, back of the house. A pack of cards. If you want to debate an evolutionist, another rabbit trail, just take a deck of cards. And uh, <clears throat> this is how you do this. You say, this, this is a brand new deck, right? 52 cards. They're in a special sorted order. Okay. You believe in evolution through random chance, right? How order comes out of randomness so here's the the experiment here i will uh, shuffle the deck and i'll reorder it using my intelligence reorder it to the original sort order by using my mind see this works with computers too there's the sort algorithms and you Knowing what the original order was, you just use random selection of the cards. And we'll see how long it takes me to reorder the deck into the original order and how long it takes you to reorder 52 cards by random selection into the original order. 
End of debate. He'll never do it. Not in a million lifetimes. Because the probability of that happening are like, oh, a bazillion. No, much bigger than a bazillion. It's a number beyond the number of electrons in the universe. Estimated. Huge. That's only 52 cards. Now, you try to get a complex protein by random selection. <laughs> Outside of a living organism. Wow. No way. See, variety was, God built variety into the genetics. Especially into sexual reproduction, which basically almost all creatures use in one degree or another. Some of them use both, but asexual and sexual. But plants, by the way, have both eggs and sperm. So, so how can you imagine a gender-confused geranium? Or is that germanium? I don't know. Geranium, I think. I can mix it up with the element. Uh, or tulip, a genetically confused tulip. Well, that would be the end of that species. <laughs> what can you say? The West is decadent, that's what you can say, and lost its minds under the judgment of God. So, let me go on here. So, do not uh, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. Uh, cheat's a little weak, but according to the tradition of Mount, take you captive might be better, take you, make you a slave. According to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. The idea like philosophy, like uh, Calvinism. Taking you captive to a system of theology or Lutheranism or Roman Catholicism or any of these things. Taking you a captive to a, a system of religion uh, that's according to the tradition of men not according, and, and, and man-made philosophy and other things. Because all these things have a lot of Aristotle mixed in with them and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, in bodily form. Christ, God, can't separate the two. But Christ is also fully man. Amazing that God became a man. The Creator entered into his creation. And then entered into us. And you are complete. I mean, here, this is another one of those places where the Greek is stronger. Uh, full. Filled to the brim. In him, who is the head of all principality and power. This is a, um, I'm going to change it here too. All authority. It's, it's exousia. And, uh, no, uh, Arche, it's, it's, ru it's rule over all rule principality. That's silly. Uh, that, to most readers, that's not going to make sense. They just follow the King James there. They should have changed it. Arche, rule. And power, uh, exousia, though, it's, it's lawful power. It's not just power. It's lawful power. Uh, power is dunamis. This is lawful power. This is exousia. This is like a, a police officer or anyone with a firearm has the power to shoot someone. You could use that weapon to shoot someone. You have the ability to shoot someone if you choose. But a police officer in the proper performance of his duty, or even a civilian under certain circumstances, has the exousia to shoot someone. Like in the state of Illinois. If someone's trying to kill me or cause me great bodily harm or my wife or an another person, I have the authority 
by the state of Illinois and God to intervene using whatever force is necessary to stop the attack, including deadly force. I have the authority to shoot them. That's a difference between, but I don't have the authority to shoot someone because I don't like them. Even though I have the power to do it, I don't have the authority. That's a difference. And it's an important difference. And that's why I will take interest, uh, I will correct translations when I think it's important. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. He's referring to the new covenant and the new heart. He's not referring to a physical, external thing. A cutting away of the, the foreskin. That's not what Paul's talking about. He's making a spiritual... He's a, the true mirror... The, the physical is only a sign of the real. The spiritual... Because circumcision was given to Abraham as a sign, as a reminder of the righteousness that he had through faith in God. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him, reckoned to him, as righteousness. His faith was. And circumcision was given to him as a sign that he was righteous by faith. And that was totally corrupted by the Jews. See, natural, unregenerate man corrupts everything. Everything. He's sinful. He can even corrupt the plowing of the field, as, as the writer of uh, Proverbs says, even the plowing of the wicked is sinful. Why? Because he doesn't do it out of faith. The New Testament says all that is not of faith is sin. If you don't do it in trust of God, in trust in God, you do it for some other reason, you're, you're sinning. You're not doing it with an attitude, proper attitude. So the spiritual attitude is what's uh, important here. So he's talking, uh, buried with him in baptism. Now, this isn't about water baptism. Water baptism is a, is a symbol or a sign of the spiritual reality. The word baptize, uh, baptism, baptizo, means to immerse. It means to wash. It also was used of like dyeing garments. So you plunged it into the solution of dye. And the dye penetrates, right, and comes out colored, comes out different. Uh, so we are baptized into Christ by the Spirit of God. Uh, uh, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but he that is coming after me will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. So the baptism that is speaking here is not physical water baptism, which is just a symbol. But uh, and the, the immersion and then the re-immersion out of the water is a symbol of being buried with him and rising again. But uh, it is... When we're baptized by the Spirit of God, we're baptized into Christ and craft in Christ so much so that Christ fills us. Then he dwells in us. Buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him. When was Christ buried and when was, was he raised? Like almost 2,000 years ago. It has to do with what he did. See, salvation is about what God does, not about what we do. You were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in trespasses and sins, in your trespasses and sins, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made you alive together with him. You were dead in trespasses and sins, and now you are made alive toward God. So you were dead. You're, you had no relationship. You were estranged from God. You were separated from God because of your sinfulness. And your hostility toward God. Your avoidance of God. And now, because you've been born again, you you are made alive because of what Christ did on the cross. 
together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, because Christ paid for them, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that were against us, which were contrary to us, uh, God's notebook of all your violations, basically what this is saying, uh, the, the indictments against you, all the breaking, the breaking of all his commandments. He was keeping notes. That's what this is the idea of. Yep, you did this, you did this, you did this, you didn't do this, you did those things. The record of all your sins. He has done what? He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Christ died for you. He paid the penalty. Paid in full. Wiped them out. God doesn't have probation. It's gone. Christ paid for it 2,000 years ago, almost. He was made uh, alive together with him. Excuse me, wrong verse. Having disarmed the principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them, talking about Satan and his angels. Satan's plan, starting with the Garden of Eden, is undone in the cross. Now, we haven't seen the, the full restoration of all things yet, but that will begin to come. To, the next stage of that will be when the return of Christ comes. And even then, there's a thousand years of millennium for God to, re, to re completely bring back creation to its uh, in full subjection to what it's supposed to be, to its original purpose. But then, okay, get down to uh, verse uh, 16 here. So let no one judge you in food or drink. Again, we're talking about traditions of man. Or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbath, Messianic Judaism, uh, no... No meat on Fridays, uh, which has now been done away with. See, what was a mortal sin is no longer a mortal sin. And then once, once upon a time, there was no mortal sin involved in eating meat on uh, beef or something on Friday. And then there was, for political reasons. <laughs> Traditions of men. It's going to be a long video, I think which are a shadow of the things to come. But the substance is of Christ. He is the substance. Then let no one uh, cheat you or take you captive uh, through delight in false humility and the worship of angels intruding on those things which he has not seen vainly puffed up by his fleshing mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is of God. Therefore, if you have died with Christ, I was talking about baptism, but he's talking about when you came to Christ, when you surrendered yourself to Christ, when you called on God to save you from your sins through Jesus Christ, and you were born again, you've died on the cross with him because you, your life is now his life, and his life is now your life. You have been united to Christ. You, you died with him on the cross, spiritually, because he's become our life. Therefore, if you died with Christ, From the basic uh, principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. Man-made rules, or even Old Testament law. Christians aren't under the law. We're under Christ. We're under the law of Christ's love.
which all concern things that perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men, fasting, dietary laws, vegetarianism, things like that you think you have to do. This is uh, things that you think will gain approval. Tithing, tithing. If you think you're going to get blessed by God because you give 10%, you're living by works, not by faith. And you're condemned by that. Beware. According to the commandments and doctrines of men, not according to Christ, these things have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and the neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Yeah, you can't beat the flesh with the flesh. That's why New Year's resolutions never work. I'm going to, by my willpower, your willpower is the flesh. If then you are raised with Christ, seek the things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on uh, things on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's where I ended the sermon, too, by the way. Well, I'm going to uh, stop the video now. This is the end of part one, and we'll get on to the subject in part two. So, uh, long rabbit trails, I guess, but worth listening to, I think.